you saw the video title and you're probably asking yourself, how is randomness from rolling a dice actually related to software that we write? You see, we need this randomness, aka not being able to predict the behavior of the software that we write in some cases. And these cases are very important to know because they actually can make your systems more robust and effective. And this is exactly what we're going to learn in this video in the context of load balancing infrastructure and all this kind of stuff. So if you're ready, let's get started. All right, so I'm going to be using a razor today as a blackboard in order to go over all of these illustrations, not because a razor is the sponsor of this video, but because I genuinely love this product because you can create different types of diagrams like flowcharts, cloud architectures, entity relationships, and in my case, it's often cloud architectures. So literally give it a try, go to eraser.io and check it out yourself. All right, so we're gonna start with retry mechanisms. I already have a video, a short one on this, but today we're gonna dive deep into it in terms of the randomness and see how randomness is actually employed there. So first of all, you know that there is a thing such as retries, meaning let's say we have our application, aka some kind of a service, and there's another service which has many instances, or it can also be simply different services. Let's say we have three different services, and they all depend on our application, aka on our server. And as everything in life, our service can crash. All right, our service can crash and all of these instances are going to detect that there's a failure because for some reason they all made a request at the same time and so that, okay, it failed. Now, they're obviously going to retry this request. So what they can do is they can be stupid and retry it right away. This is very naive and you wouldn't really see this often in production. This is probably for simple scripts. But they can also do a linear backup, meaning a type of an interval retry. Let's say they will retry in two seconds, or they can, and then they're gonna retry in four seconds, and then in six, and so on. But they can also do an exponential backup, meaning they can retry in one second, then they can retry in three seconds, then they can retry in eight, and then the next one is probably gonna be like maybe 16. And so you get the idea, it goes exponentially up. And of course, they can randomly just every service can randomly retry a request. Okay, where's the issue? Let's say for some reason, when all of these retries are coming at the same time to our service, there's going to be a thing called a connection storm, meaning our application or our service is trying to restart, it's booting up. And as soon as it's booted up, like not all of the processes under the hood are finished so that it can function properly, but it gets bombarded with other requests from other services. And it's going to, it actually can happen that it goes in circles, like it restarts, it gets bombarded, it crashes, it restarts, it bombard, it's bombarded by requests and crashes again. So for this, maybe meaning to avoid this kind of a storm, what we can add is actually randomness, meaning every instance that makes a retry request to our service is going to have some kind of a randomness at the timestamp that they make a request. And this randomness is actually a very popular thing nowadays in distributed systems. Meaning let's say instance one is going to make a re next request in 2.2 seconds. This instance is going to make a request in 2.1.5 seconds, literally small uh, deviations, small randomness. And for example, Apache Kafka actually also adds this and randomness to their to its retries. For example, to avoid connection storms, a randomization factor of 0.2, meaning 20%, will be applied to the timeout resulting in a random range between 20% below and 20% above the computed value. So as you can see, even Kafka actually uh, uses randomness in their clusters. All right, the next point is a chaos monkey. Yeah, actually this thing exists, a chaos monkey, is a monkey that is going to destroy our services one by one in a very random fashion. You might ask, what the hell, why do I need someone crashing my services? Well, the thing is Netflix, as you know, has a very big platform and it's a very, very distributed systems that's kind of became notorious for their huge distributed system, all right? And Netflix actually created this thing called a chaos monkey. It's basically a kind of a cron job under the hood. That's what it is. That has a database with all the schedules, 
of when it's going to wake up and start shutting down your services. The reason behind this simple to actually make force you not make but force you to build full total tolerant applications. Meaning if one of our services are going down, we still have to be able to function with two services. And Chaos Monkey ensures just that. If you wake up, you go to work in the morning and you see that your application was just down the whole time, meaning Chaos Monkey crashed some of the services and you still didn't do a good job of being fault tolerant. So you need to do something here. And the monkey, Chaos Monkey actually says that. Chaos Monkey is responsible for randomly terminating instances in production. And this is actually a keyword. You deploy this thing in production. Now it sounds very scary. <laughs> like maybe you need to do it in a staging environment. And I would actually say Probably yes, like why would you hurt yourself and do this in production? But that's the actual idea behind basically to ensure that engineers implement their services to be resilient to instance fail. All right, the next point where we actually see randomness is load balance. I have a complete video on load balancers where I go pretty in deep in different topics or points about them. But actually load balancing itself also can use randomness, which is pretty good as well. So one of the algorithms that load balancers use is called round robin. Meaning if a request reaches a load balancer, this load balancer has to send this request to one of these three services. And which one is it gonna serve it to? Well, round robin means we're gonna serve it to this one. Why? Because the next incoming request is going to be served into this one. So it literally goes like one, one, one. And then the next request is going to again start with the left one, go to the middle one, and then go to the right one. So it's basically serving one service at a time in a sequence. Another popular algorithm is called least connection, meaning load balancer is going to see because it's able to read the health and CPU usage, sorry, not CPU usage, but how many connections the service is actually handling at the moment. And it's going to send a request to the one that's handling the minimum of requests or connections at this point. Then the next one is called resource based. And this is what I previously mentioned with the CPU, it's going to monitor the CPUs of these services by sending heartbeat. And, and then it's going to re redirect the request to the one that has the least resources uh, to it. Now, last but not least, we also have random. And you might ask why would you actually use a random load balancer or a random algorithm for a load balancer? The answer is, it's actually the best one if you think about it. Meaning if your services actually have the same kind of specs, meaning they have the same RAM, they have the same memory, why not use the random one? Why does it matter? Because we can literally randomize which request go, goes where, and according to the normal distribution, they're all going to end up fine. Because if you use round robin, you literally need to have a counter. You literally, you literally need to count how which requests went where because the next one has to go to the next one and not to the first one. If you least use least connections or resource base, you need to keep track of these connections there and the memory usage, meaning you always need to monitor these services. But random doesn't have to do anything of that. So it's kind of lightweight and actually suit some use cases the best. Last but not least, we also have consensus protocols. So the word consensus actually means a group of things or people agreeing on something. Let's say voting for a prime minister or the, for the parliament, all right? And in our case, it's not people or things, or rather it is things actually, the nodes in the cluster, all right? So one of the nodes is usually going to be the main node, all right? Or in the Kubernetes world, Kubernetes, now I pronounced correctly, you have a control pet plane, which is like the brain, aka the main node, and you have like other nodes, aka child nodes, we can call them. All right. So the, the parent node always sends heartbeats to this child node to be able to know which one actually is alive or not. And then these child nodes are going to send a response back to signify that, hey, I'm still alive. I can handle requests if you want me to. Now, the thing is, what happens when the, the main node crashes? In normal cases, when you have everything set up well, the, the very first one that actually sends or recognizes that the main node is dead is going to declare themselves as the main node. Okay, this is quite interesting. But now the issue starts here. What happens when the node leader node dies or the main node dies and a follower, aka child node, you have only two of them. They're literally 
not going to be able to split the candidacies and they're going to end up in a fight. Okay, now this is an interesting question. And for this, we have many consensus algorithms. One of the famous ones and one of the, let's say, newest ones based on a paper is called the Raft Consensus Algorithm. And it actually works behind Kubernetes. So what does it do? It's basically a consensus algorithm that's designed to be easy to understand. And it is, if you actually look at this illustration, now you can see that S2 is the main node, it sends heartbeats, it receives them. And let's say if we kill this S5, we're gonna say stop and then start again. You're gonna see that it's not sending any heartbeats, but now let's kill the actual leader. So we're gonna stop this and start again. And you can see that these guys are timing out. And now the first one is going to be S4 apparently. So let's see what happens. Well, now S4 declares itself as a lead and it sends heartbeats again. And of course it sends it to everyone just to acknowledge, just to see which ones are still alive. And only S1 and S3 are sending them back. Now you also notice that these guys have kind of a timeout that's going there. Well, this timeout actually decides a lot of stuff. First of all, whether the heartbeat is going to go back in the time window, indicating that this instance is alive, but it also decides whether this node is going to be elected as a leader. And these timeouts are actually assigned randomly. So as you can see, randomizing randomization is also working here with the raft consensus algorithm. How cool is that? If you guys liked this video, please leave a like, become a member of the channel because we already have one member of the channel. And by the way, thank you very much. And of course, subscribe so that you don't miss any future videos. And check out our sponsors because if you wanna support our channel, you could also support the sponsor. And I will see you guys in the next one. Goodbye.